Press out front. Are you kidding me? No, no. Oh. Hi, how are you? Yeah, it's fine. Okay. Well, I know you're too. This is Mary Ellen Joyce. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 How are you? Yeah. This is yeah. Mr. President. Mr. President, Mr. President, Mr. President Mr. Mason okay. and Dick Eisen to work for me and for Wendy. Nice to see all of you. Whoops. I don't want to get in your way. Thank you, Mr. President. Hi, Mr. President. Judy Black number is not on my staff, but I'd like to have her. Excuse me. All right. Will you get this in, please? Hope the size of those books doesn't scare you. How are you? Fine. All right. Good to see you. Well, it's. Good to see you both, and I surely appreciated receiving the National Governor's recommendations to modify troublesome administrative and regulatory requirements that the federal government imposes on states. Very soon I'll be talking to the American people about an economic bill of rights, and one of those rights will be the right to pursue your business free of excessive federal regulation or taxation. My administration is been committed to reducing that burden over the past six years, first through our paperwork and regulatory reduction, and then by tax reform and adoption of our federalism principles, and very shortly with our economic bill of rights. We've demonstrated our commitment, and so have you, and I hope we'll continue to hear from you whenever you see that we at the federal level are standing in the way of your ability to govern. One of my favorite stories about runaway bureaucracy and it was a true story. It was a fellow here in Washington whose job was sitting there and papers came to him and he had to figure where they were to be passed on to and he'd initial them and send them on. And he did. One paper came one day that was marked secret, but it came to him, so he figured out where it should go and initialed it and sent it on. 24 hours later, it came back to him with a memo attached that said, you weren't supposed to see this. Erase your initials and initial the erasure. <laughs> <laughs> so seriously, as you know, I asked the Office of Management and Budget and my Intergovernmental Affairs Office to coordinate and review your recommendations. But we've made progress, and I want to present you with the results of that review. It's in these books, and uh, they're descriptions of our implementation of about 45 of your recommendations, including documents demonstrating the changes have been or will soon be made. For example, Governor Ashcroft raised the concern that teenage girls in foster care who became mothers were unable to get medical assistance for their infants. This was because foster care payments were counted as income, and so the newborns who were medically at risk and urgently in need of medical attention were getting it. Now, under our tax reform passed last year, the mother's foster care payments will not keep the child from being eligible for medical assistance. In another example, Governor Sinner and others told us that they wanted their states to administer federal airport development grants because you felt you could do a better job than Washington. Well, we agree. And so we've proposed legislation for a new block grant program to give states the administrative responsibility for much of the airport funding. If passed by Congress, states would have more authority to make their own decisions about how to allocate their funds. So if you want to lean on some of your congressmen about getting this done, we'll, we'll be grateful. The Vice President chairs our task force on regulatory relief, and believe me, he's always looking for new candidates for regulatory relief. And I encourage you to work with him as his task force goes about its important work. They've been tremendously successful in wiping out thousands of regulations that were on the books. But again, let me thank you for your help in helping identify these troublesome items. And I was glad to hear that federalism will be a major focus of the NGA activities for the coming year. Federalism has always been near and dear to, to my heart. That's enough out of me. <laughs> Mr. President, I want to thank you and the Vice President for the push that you were given this. It, it has meant a great deal to the governors to know that there was a receptive ear uh, that could help us do something about it. it it is important for us to be able to serve our citizens to have some flexibility in areas and a number of the relief activities that are included in this report deal with that and, and it also allows us to target funds uh, as 
intended by the law, but sometimes constrained by the details of the law, in particular the example that you gave from Governor Ashcroft's uh, recommendation falls under that domain. Uh, we look at this as a beginning. Uh, it seems like it is a large enough task that it may never end, but at least we can keep whittling away at it and make a difference for the people. I, I want to thank you very much, and I assure you, you will continue to hear from us. <laughs> We're not an easy group to get rid of. <laughs> <laughs> Having, being an alumnus, I'm <laughs> highly supportive of that. I've always believed deeply that the secret of this country's greatest, among other things, was the fact that we are a federation of sovereign states from the very beginning, and that was implanted here. And I think there, uh, there has been, over some recent years, kind of temporarily, but there has been a belief on the part of many at the federal level that the state should be reduced to administrative districts of the federal government. And I think that's throwing away the very thing that made us great. There is an inventiveness at the state level, that a, an ability to experiment that can then be passed on and improve life for everybody in other states also. And we want to encourage that. Uh, let me also uh, thank you. I, I want to take a little different tack, um, but it's basically uh, derived from the same Trust that you have cast on this uh, project and on the meeting. Uh, I'm very caught up in, in a problem with electrical energy because we're big producers in this, this state of North Dakota. And we did a study of what it costs to get coal out of the ground and what portion of that cost is societally imposed costs, workman's comp, unemployment insurance, uh, Social Security withholding, Environmental Protection Agency, OSHA, uh, Equal Opportunity, uh, Retirement Benefits, Health Benefits, probably the highest liability costs in the history of the world, uh, state bonding for reclamation. At any rate, we discovered that almost 40% of the cost of the coal, societally imposed costs, and it becomes very a very sharp issue when we're getting Canadian competition uh, and, and some of you are aware of that issue that Canadians have been beating on us for environmental and we discovered that of the 140 coal-fired generators in Canada not a single one has a scrubber on it and, and I, uh, I really we have begun internally in the state to try to reduce as far as we can the societally imposed costs on our industries for the very reasons that you have mentioned and so uh, it, it's imperative that we work at our level, we work together to reduce these costs. And, and I think uh, this communication between the governors and the administration is, is really a significant effort that, that I, we want to perpetuate as much as we can. I have always said you, you fellas uh, have a job that's the closest in comparison to this present job that I have anybody in the country, and, and it is. I, well, I, we just, I'm all for it. And I could match your, your story with a few that I treasured back in my days that I found. I discovered, for example, a golf course that owned some land that wasn't using adjacent to one of the freeways, and so they leased it to a nearby farmer and he raised corn on it. And then they decided to enlarge the course and they took back that land from the lease and made that into fairway. And the government gave them a payment for taking corn land out of British production. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't realize that the Canadians didn't have a single scrubber. They have, they have 139 coal-fired gener generators in Canada. Not a single one has a scrubber on well, then how do they And yet they, they give us all this garbage. Yeah, I was going to say, they, 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 they could get more indignant than most anybody. has come from the smelter in Ontario, yeah. which at one point was 5% of all the sulfur oxide emissions in North America. Let me add to so they're meeting the total, they claim they're meeting yes. their total limits, but doing it all this way, yeah. adding all these We see they do it on a smelter because that's an export product that we pay for. In addition, we can hardly build a, a, a hydro generator in America anymore because of the environmental demands. And, and I'm not quarrel, that's another issue. What part of those demands are valid is a separate issue entirely, but many of them are valid. Boris uh, just 
a month and a half ago was asked how long it would take to get the environmental study done for that plant they're talking about. He said, well, what are you talking about? We aren't going to do an environmental study. And, and so, I, you know, this whole thing has gotten so irritating to the states that are dependent on electrical generation, on, on energy generation of all kinds, uh, by this influx of energy from either from the Saudis or, in this case, electricity. Uh, John's plant over there, with the hydro or the uh, nuclear plant, uh, they're absolutely being blown away with a very fraudulent case. And uh, we, we all reached a, a new level of anger when, when they hired uh, the, uh, D, Michael Deeper to come in and lobby for them. And, and we did some research, and, and there is no, they're not, there's not even a scrubber ordered for those plants. <laughs> They can get mighty indignant, Mr. President, about acid rain. I want to remember this in a future conversation, too. <laughs> yeah. and one more fact, then, to keep in mind. The Canadians produce one-tenth as much emissions as the United States with one-twentieth the population. And therefore, on a per capita basis, they have twice as much emissions as we do. And we do it on the basis of per industrial output. It's three times. Can I add where, where one does, more? Well, last question. Where does their downwind plume go? Who does it affect? Themselves in New England. The prevailing wind in the Northwest. Well, is they that argue that our plume goes north. Is that a documented fact? Really That's another fact to remember with your good friend Mulroney, Mr. Preston, is that well, plume, anyway. all right, that plume uh, affects our northeastern state. The Canadians don't all. like to talk acid rain. Yeah. <laughs> or me either. There's one other issue in this in this particular that's so fundamental with the Canadian negotiations, and I know you're deep into them, and I talk to Peter and Clay a lot. But all of the electricity in Canada is owned by the provinces. They they borrow all the money to build all their plants, whether they be coal-fired or hydro. They back up their borrowings with the full faith and credit of the province, and they're buying their money, all of which is borrowed, for about 3% less than we can buy it, than our private investor-owned companies can buy it. In addition to that, they are marketing into our market at 80% of displaced costs, regardless of what it is. And that is documented. They have routinely told our buyers, we'll give you the power for 80% of, of what you have to pay for it at a, in a domestic and it's just it's blowing our people uh, out of just blowing us out of the water, and it's, the long-term implications are very serious. And we're you know we're hurting bad enough. I, I don't want to belabor this, but I think what Governor Sinner is saying is it wasn't really the intention of this meeting. Uh, but no. with all due respect, this country does not have an energy policy. We thought we had an oil and gas policy, and we don't know now whether we want high oil prices and a strong domestic industry or low oil prices and no industry. And, with an answer somewhere in between. We, we still don't have the wherewithal to debate it and find out where we want to end. And it applies to the hydro problem, to the coal problem, to the nuclear, nuclear problem. And, and if there's any long-range problem that has, in my opinion, been left unanswered for a decade or so, it is the energy issue. Mr. Preston, yeah, Mr. Preston, Jim Coombe says it's oh, time to go. Yes. And I've heard that, and I'll tell you the rest of it. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> I just saw on television this morning, though, speaking of some of the futuristic things, and this was somebody boasting about solar power for, for, general, for power and all. And he was using an example in California, and I couldn't believe my eyes. Here was 40 acres of desert, totally covered, just rank on rank of Wind. the reflectors. Mm -hmm. Forty acres of desert that you couldn't even walk across it anymore because of these 40 acres of sun. Now, I don't know, that's just for one generation uh, generating uh, plant there. I don't know how much power it gives, but can you imagine trying to heat the state of California with solar power? <laughs> Most of that is tax uh, derived. Isn't that's it? right. Most of it's tax credit. Yeah. The same with the wind generators over at Palm Springs. There are acres and acres and acres of wind generators that are all motivated by the new tax law took care of it. Yeah, it? and that's a thing of the past now. That's the truth. Thank you, Mr. President. Thank you very much. much. Well, this is good to see you. Good to see you. Thank you. Good to see you. And as I say, yeah, it's good to meet you, sir. Stay, yes. uh, we will see you. Stay calm. We'll be back tonight. Sorry, 2090. Tell you what, I'll go to the way. Okay. Thank you, Mr. Good to see you. Yes, sir. Thank you. Thank you.
Wendy's a star in the regular deal.